Hey everyone, hope you're all well. Thanks again for checking out another AdsCast episode. Um, I saw an interview with the Scottish actor Billy Boyd this weekend. Now for those of you who may not know who he is, his most famous performance is that of Peregrine Took um, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And he was asked to give his opinion on the Amazon TV show The Rings of Power. And he said he really, really enjoyed it. He said it was great to see parts of that mythical world that had never been shown before and he really really enjoyed the story and, and the whole show and it got, kind of got me thinking because I, I watched it and uh, I saw The Lord of the Rings probably like most people and The Hobbit. I've read all the books, I'd even seen previous incarnations, TV shows and whatnot and when I was much younger and I fancied myself as a bit of an amateur dramatic actor I even partook in productions of Lord of the Rings. So I've got experience of reading the material, of seeing the material in various carnations, and having had some form of participation. And when I saw his interview, I agreed with some of what he said, specifically being able to see more of the world in a period that we'd never seen before. But I disagreed with his opinion on the actual show itself. So I thought that I would give my review or my opinion of Amazon's TV show, The Rings of Power. So here it is. For those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, The Rings of Power is a TV show, the most expensive TV show ever made, part of a multi-season commitment that Amazon, through its Amazon Prime service, has made into exploring the world of Middle-earth, or Arda as it's called, in a much more expansive way than we saw in either The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings films. Now, you may be a little bit confused by this, especially if you are more of a casual fan or somebody who only knows the stories through the films. So allow me to elaborate. Um, the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit were written by an English author called J.R.R. Tolkien uh, almost 100 years ago, as it goes. Um, and it's set in a mythical world which sort of has parallels with our world and could be construed as being a sort of a mythical history as to what came before and how events unfolded that would eventually lead to us, uh, you know, man being on Earth as we know it now. Tolkien created an entire mythical universe as the setting um, and a backdrop for his stories. Um, and he created almost like a chronological series of events which talk about the creation of the heavens and the Earth, um, and how his version of Earth evolved through various epochs or ages and eventually it ends with the period that we know where the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings took place. So it may surprise you to find out that The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings were not the only things that happened in this world. In fact, the events of those particular stories happened towards the end of an era that Tolkien called the Third Age. So he divided up his history of everything that had happened into these epochs, these ages for want of a better term. You had all the prehistoric stuff which happened up to, from the point of creation, up to the start of what he calls the First Age. Then you have the First Age, then the Second Age, then the Third Age, which at the end of that is when we pick up the story of the Hobbits and the Lord of the Rings. And then we go into the Fourth Age, which is what he sort of um, anecdotally called the Age of Men. So you could almost say that everything up to the Fourth Age is like a mythical history of everything that happened before. And you could almost say that the Fourth Age is how the world from sort of medieval dark ages might have looked and the age of men as we know it now the last few thousand years might have happened of course it's not history it is fantasy it is fiction but that's the sort of chronological way of how this comes to pass and so the rings of power take place a long time before the events of the hobbit and the lord of the rings in fact there are very very few characters which are retained given the amount of time that is preceding uh, the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And the Rings of Power take place in what Tolkien called the Second Age. 
And it's important to point out that apart from the huge investment that Amazon's made into this, um, they bought the rights, which were held through what's called the Tolkien estate, but they didn't have the full rights. So they couldn't just go in and do what they wanted or bring to life all of the writings. There were some characters and some stories and some character arcs that they didn't get the rights to. And as a result, it means that they couldn't just effectively plop certain characters and certain events into the show. So they had to have an element of artistic license and some of their own creativity to fill some holes and plug some gaps for the sake of what they would have to create a continuity for their show and for the narrative, which is for a modern day audience. So it's not a like for like bringing to life of Tolkien's writings. It takes inspiration and follows some of Tolkien's narrative, but it also goes off on its own tangent to create a backstory. So what is the Rings of Power actually all about? Well, the whole element of The Hobbit, which then leads into The Lord of the Rings, is there's this really, really, really evil guy called Sauron who wants to take over Middle-earth. He's like the world's baddest motherfucker, the baddest sorcerer that you ever did see. And he wants to control everyone through manipulation, not just through military might. And he does that through magic. And he's able to wield his will almost portray and enforce his will unto others through a magical ring. So he, as Tolkien writes, he was a master of disguise, a master of manipulation, a master of persuasion. He didn't just, you know, ruthlessly slaughter people. He made use of any skill, any tool that was available to him. So he would manipulate and he would cause people to self-doubt and he would be extremely charismatic to get people to do actions that he wanted without them realising, without necessarily needing to raise arms. And as part of that, he was able to corrupt some of the most powerful beings in Middle-earth. He got them to forge mythical rings, which enhanced their own sort of magical powers. And he then went off to forge his own ring, the One Ring, which would then rule them all. And that was obviously the whole point of the Lord of the Rings. So what the Rings of Power is all about is the backstory to lead to the forging of those original Rings of Power prior to Sauron then going off on his own to create the One Ring. It's worth just doing a little bit of a back step and saying, all right, let's do a quick summary of the Rings of Power as its own story. And then let's compare it to Tolkien and we can take a bit of a view. So the Rings of Power has a lot of uh, retained characters. From the elven world, we have Galadriel, originally played by Kate Blanchett. And we have Lord Elrond, originally played by Hugo Weaving. Of course, they're both much younger because it's set thousands of years um, prior to the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. <coughs> so they are in the elven world in Middle-earth. Uh, the elven kingdoms are ever so slightly different. Uh, than we saw originally. We still have the race of dwarves. We see um, Khaz of Doom um, and the kingdom of Durin, which was referred to during the Lord of the Rings, because if you remember when Gandalf the Grey dies when fighting a Balrog, it is in that dwarven kingdom that they're in. So we get to see that in, at the height of its power. We get to see the race of men, uh, in Middle-earth, they're significantly weaker and in lower number than in Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit because they haven't had time to establish their kingdoms and to grow in power and influence and to sort of get in preparation for what will become their age. So the elves historically had been more powerful, the dwarves had been more powerful, and men really were comparatively weak and really pathetic, almost poor-looking by comparison. However, we also see the mythical race of men on the island nation of Numenor. Um, now, Numenor wasn't really referred to in the original films, but we will touch on that shortly as to what it was and how it came to be. We see the backstory of how the race of men is slowly finding its place in the world. We see the story of how the dwarves are, through their incessant mining, will eventually lead to their downfall. And we see what will lead the elves from their own motives to almost become the de facto arrogant leaders, for want of a better term, of Middle-earth. And of course, most importantly, we see Sauron 
in some way, shape or form, as he starts to put the bits of his plan into place for what will eventually be his ascension and his rise to power, his greed and his wish to manipulate everyone else, and ultimately what will lead to the events of the Lord of the Rings and the Forging of the Rings. So following on from Billy Boyd's uh, opinion, which is how I started this episode, what are the good bits and then what are the bad bits? And then we can sort of have a look and compare it to how Tolkien structured this. First thing to point out from a cinematography point of view, it is absolutely amazing. It's one of the most beautifully filmed uh, artistic and picturesque TV shows I've ever seen. Um, we take the special effects, the visual effects from those original six films. And now that we're a little bit down the line in terms of technology, the, the visual splendor is off the scale. You know, seeing great seas, seeing even more realistic beasts, interaction between orcs and, and goblins, seeing places such as Valinor and Numenor that we'd never seen before, seeing how Mordor will be formed. These are visually stunning. Uh, waterfalls and great sculpture and other beasts is just... I, I, I don't know if I've seen a show on the same scale when it comes to the visual effects. I mean, you can watch Game of Thrones and House of Dragon and all these other mythical world shows and I don't think they touch on the landscape and the visual shots that Rings of Power brings to the table. It really is epic. It's, it's, you need to see it almost just for that. Uh, what else it does well is the, the dialogue in the interactions and the way that they bring these characters through the story. That was something I thought Peter Jackson did quite well. Yes, he took artistic license and a bit of liberties in some instances, but those characters, the likes of Legolas and Gimli and Aragorn, they've become part of cinema, cinema folklore. You know, they are movie legends in their own right, those characters. <clears throat> and that same pace and type of dialogue is retained in this show. And that's great to see. You see that world come to light and they do, they do justice to that dialogue, the way that the elves speak, the way the dwarves speak. It's... Um, no, it's great to see that, and they and they, they, they honour it very, very nicely. I thought generally the pace of the show was okay. You, I'll talk about the the decision they made to condense a huge amount of writing into a short space. Once you get over that, and you realise this is going to be a condensed story, it moves at an okay pace. So from a, from a story arc point of view, and getting their point across, and getting that TV show put together, and how it's shot and how the characters interact with one another, I thought it was, I thought it was excellent. A very, very good production. Unfortunately for me, that's where the majority of my enjoyment starts to wane. The reason why I say that is because they, s <laughs> the first episode is 150 million thousand miles an hour in those opening um, scenes. We start in a very picturesque landscape, which turns out to be Valinor, which is the eternal undying lands where I'll come on to the chronological, chronological events shortly, <clears throat> but it's where the elves effectively wish to go to. It's where they're all traveling to when we see them leaving Middle Earth in Lord of the Rings. And we see a bit of a backstory from Galadriel when she was young, interactions where she had an older brother, and it sets into, slowly explains and sets into motion a series of events where they basically rush through the entire creation story in the first age in the blink of an eye. And we fast forward into the second age and it's almost like a whoa, what the fuck moment. It's just, it's too much, it's too fast, it's too crazy. If you're going to do something like that, you should do a softer opening, which is what they did in the first episode, The Fellowship of the Ring, of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which is... You start your point in the story and you do a small intro of a much smaller space of time to explain to where you've got to. It just seemed far, far, far too much. And what it immediately shouts to me is they've picked the wrong story from which to start on. So as I explained before, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings only make up a, sec a selection of stories that Tolkien wrote. 
he had a series of works called the unfinished tales which as you can imagine were notes and unfinished writings which he never got to complete stories for his son christopher tolkien did look to complete those and compiled all of those remaining notes and stories <coughs> into what became the silmarillion which is the closest thing we have to sort of an encyclopedia on on tolkien's world so if you're going to start with the rings of power then you should do a much shorter intro for a much smaller space of preceding time i actually think they should have started at the beginning the way that tolkien starts it's almost like the bible there's a lot of similarities actually in, um, between those he talks about the lord god eru who existed for time immaterial and he wove a music and from that music he created effectively his angels which are the Ainu and that's the closest kind of sort of allegory that I can come to is that they are these angelic beings and rather than just have them dancing in the sky weaving this amazing music he created the earth Arda as a place to channel and focus their spirit whatever you um whatever you want to call it and the uh the, the the world was created with nothing really in it and it was free for the Ainu to almost shape it as they as they saw fit in addition to them we have a slightly lesser powerful almost like a second class version of Ain of angel called the Maya so you have the Ainu and the Maya and between them they weave the patterns and they create and form the world as we start to know it there's seas and there's continents and what have you and they create what became Valinor this vast continent where their spirit will live forever and that's as we start on a very basic level of creation it would have been amazing to see that some sort of visual spectacle to see uh the spirits even if they're sort of sparkling starry type things on the screen and the earth effectively coming into existence that would have been amazing the raising of continents i think that would have been a spectacular thing to see we then move and this is pre-first age now and we move into a period where everything's perfect and everything's wonderful and we have land and we have sea but something happens the most uh powerful of the Ainu is a bit selfish he has more power than all of the others and that selfishness manifests in an almost a greed a necessity to have it all he wants the power of creation for himself this Ainu went by the name of Melkor he would later be called Morgoth he is almost like the fallen angel he almost is like the devil he is the source the root and the reason that there is evil in the world and so he rebelled and so a great number of internal skirmishes and battles are had between the Ainu <coughs> and this Melkor um, spirit. They think they defeat him once, but he comes back. And for a, for a, a, for a period of time, all of this is self-contained within Valinor. But Melkor then takes refuge in Middle-earth, into the northern part. It's almost like the, northern, the North Pole or Arctic Circle of Middle-earth. And he corrupts one of the Maya, those second-class spirits. And that particular spirit was the most powerful of all the Maya. So you have the most powerful Ainu and the most powerful Maya in, in cahoots. And he eventually will be given the name of Sauron. So Sauron becomes the chief lieutenant of Morgoth. And if we fast forward through this, we get to a period called the, the, the lighting of the, of the trees, which is prior to there being the sun and the moon the only light in all of the world came from these two incredible trees that had been lit which provided light in Valinor and Morgoth was intent on destroying them and he did and it was only through the intervention of other spirits that they were able to harness just those last remaining little bits of these trees that they were able to create the stars in the sky the moon and the sun and I think that would have been a brilliant visual thing to do you could have done creation in one episode you could have done skirmishes across two or three and you could have ended the i guess period 
the destruction of those of those trees and the creation of the sky as your season finale and that would have been a really amazing thing to see and it's a shame we didn't get to see that it's over in the blink of an eye this is a prehistory period where all of middle earth is in perpetual darkness and it's during this period that the first beings awoke the first beings to awake were the elves who were given the gift of immortality and they make their way into middle earth some of them by some inner spiritual power realize that there is this spiritual home in Valinor and they look to make this journey to try and see the light of the trees because it's it's darkness everywhere else there's no night and day they became the lightened ones some of them didn't feel this calling and they would remain in middle earth and they would become wood elves or or such like so there becomes a split between the elven communities where some will travel to Valinor which is where our story in the Rings of Power starts and some will remain in Middle Earth and there's almost like a two-tier system those who have seen the light and those who have not then the second of the races awaken which is the dwarves and they will make their way of course into Middle Earth and the last race to wake was the race of men and it would have been interesting to see these these races awaken for the first time and be just confused and befuddled and uh, not know their bearings it would have been amazing to see the elves before they became arrogant make their way into middle earth and almost have this inert need to go back and see the light of the trees i think that would have been amazing i think it's a real lost opportunity that we didn't get to see that creation the years of the trees or yt as that period's called i think that would have been a fantastic season the whole thing could have been called the silmarillion and that first season could have just been creation we could have seen Eru, we could have seen the Ainu, we could have seen the Maya, we could have seen the very spirits of what Saruman and Gandalf would later be versus the very spirit of Sauron. Sauron's corruption by Melkor. Melkor <coughs> coming to Middle-earth with Sauron, being labelled Morgoth, seeing his original lair, seeing these original battles, that would have been fantastic. The creation of the Balrocks, the forging of of grabbing elves and torturing them as we later found out and seeing orcs or uruks first being created would have been brilliant and it's a shame that that's almost been robbed from us so my first nitpick about rings of power is it's a what might have been a million miles an hour for 10 minutes in the first episode where we see a crash course in why Gal galadriel is just battle crazy chick and a huge swathe over Morgoth seeing him the most powerful evil being that ever existed we don't get to see him at all and I just think it's such a shame uh, the whole thing is just a rush job oh some bad motherfucker tried to take over the, the whole of the world and some people fought back and it was a bad battle and eventually he we won and he lost and haha -ha, and now we hate him and we want to we want to fight his lieutenant we don't even see his lieutenant come to rise of power we don't really see why they want to hunt him in the first place it's just it's just not very good intro and it's just a real shame that we didn't get a proper intro to the lord of the rings world and apart from that what we didn't see is all of the build-up and all of the actions that saw the destruction of the trees so that original period in the history of middle earth and arda it's called the year of the trees and it would have been amazing to see the build-up to see Morgoth and Sauron in cahoots and the destruction of the trees because what happens at that point in time all of this is predominantly being set in uh, in Valinor when the trees are destroyed just as they're being destroyed they capture the last remnants of the trees and they are able to create the, the sky the moon and the stars and the sun and that created light for the first time in middle earth and from that for from that uh, extraction from the trees precious jewels called the cimmerils were created and these were incredibly powerful uh, jewels which of course Morgoth and many others would want at this point the year of the tr the years of the trees have finished and we enter what's called the first age and as I said before the ages lasted for hundreds if not thousands of years and the first age was very much preoccupied with Morgoth and his rampage as he tried to grab the whole world by force tried to get hold of the Cimmerils tried to conquer um well everyone and everyone basically 
with Sauron as his lieutenant. It would have been amazing to see the the emergence of men, the power of the elves, the strength of the of the Enu Morgoth himself, who was the most powerful being to set foot in Middle Earth ever. The raising of Numenor. All of that would have been um, would have been wonderful to see, and it's just a shame that we didn't get to see it. So in the first age, Sauron was very much the lieutenant to Morgoth. Morgoth is this powerful entity the source of all evil in the world the most powerful being ever the difference between Morgoth and Sauron is Morgoth re relied on his power whereas Sauron was more cunning and could use deceit as a means to get what he wanted as well more resourceful and you might say and that first age sees the creation of the Balrogs creation of dragons the first orcs and that would have been brilliant to see and it culminates that age culminates originally with Morgoth uh, being imprisoned but then he gets out of that prison and he comes again and it leads to a final battle this this war of wrath which had many individual battles and culminated with the Ainu themselves getting involved and the Maya and the elves men were divided some men fought with Morgoth they were corrupted and this is referred to in the first few episodes of the Rings of Power the men in this Southlands who were under the influence and were loyal to Morgoth and then some other men who fought with the elves and the Ainu and it was they who basically helped good triumph evil Morgoth was cast into a void never to be seen again Sauron fled and as a thank you the men who fought on behalf of the good were given the island nation of Numenor it was risen literally risen and they almost became our higher man this is from this higher man that the lineages of the kingdoms of Gondor and uh, the riders of Rohin and Aragorn himself descend it would have been great to see that I mean it's wonderful to see Numenor on TV but it would have been great to see the beginnings of this because then the whole thing would have made much more canonical sense but they they gloss over that when the first age comes to an end Morgoth is defeated and a sort of era of peace descends on Middle Earth and in Tolkien's writings this is when Sauron first starts to ascend to power he takes over where Morgoth was he commands all of Morgoth's armies any dragons that are left any orc armies that are there he bases himself in the north and basically just looks to attack however and whenever he can he's a sort of initially uh, contained and he leaves his base in the north and eventually will go east and he'll, that's where he will first start to corrupt the Easterlings um, it's where he will corrupt any other forces there like sorcerers or witches again none of that is shown in the Rings of Power we cut way past that Sauron had already risen to a point of trying to be powerful post Morgoth there's no real explanation for that in in this it's just Galadriel's fueled hatred for want of a better term we don't see Sauron rise to power once and what we see in Tolkien's writing is Sauron take on the guise of somebody called Anatar who is a, a giver of gifts and he looks to charm the elves and charm humans and he effectively it was his idea to forge the rings of power whereas in the rings of power tv show the elves have already had this idea to do something amazing just just like that there's nothing in Tolkien's writing in this age that their power is waning so why Mithril is being used as a means to stop the elves waning is just stupid and we haven't yet seen Anatar go to Numenor and and be charming and corrupt and influence them because what happened in Tolkien's writings is he would make the Numenors the Numenorians I should say take a vast army to Valinor to try and get immortality which of course humans can't have and that's what leads to their downfall the island is effectively thrown into the sea and anyone who's left has to go to Middle Earth and found their kingdoms because Numenor is gone we haven't seen that this this is the problem where because Amazon didn't have all the rights it had to create fictitious characters the uh the south the southlands didn't exist the people in the southlands didn't exist Bronwyn and her son Theo didn't exist what we see is this Lord Halbrand who we find out is, is Sauron in disguise this is a brand new character not at all charming or cunning or deceitful in the way that Tolkien writes it's just 
it's just not great storytelling when it all comes together. It's too much by chance. Sauron doesn't seem in control. Sauron doesn't seem cunning enough, doesn't seem powerful enough. Mordor is created by others, not Sauron himself. This didn't happen. It's just poor. I understand that they didn't have the rights to a particular name of a character, so they could have just renamed that character and slightly changed some of the chronological events, but still show him as the driving force behind the creation of the ongoing evil in Middle-earth. That didn't happen. It's a real source of frustration for me that they're just changing the story and almost making Sauron a recipient of fortune rather than the creator of it. The elves wanted to do something grand and Sauron just by, chuck, by sheer luck lands in the Eregion region and oh yeah let's let's do rings. Oh that's a great idea. Then he fucks off and then uh, Mordor's created by others and he goes oh yeah I like that I'll nick that for myself. That's not how it happened. It's just it's the Hollywood-esque rewriting and doing it really badly which fucked me off more than anything. The the, the story being condensed as it was I didn't like because too much is happening too quickly and they started at a really awkward point like I said amazing storytelling could have happened if they want to make this anthology of work start at the beginning do this amazing visual set the scene do the years of the trees explain Morgoth show Sauron on his side almost like a Sith in in Star Wars plotting waiting for the opportune moment to take over from his from his master then he tries to take over middle earth and is defeated a couple of times has to regain himself come at it from a different angle use cunning and being conniving rather than just brute force that would have been brilliant because you're adding incredible depth to this character and if we see it from his point of view that he's trying to save middle earth rather than destroy it you almost might have a degree of sympathy with him and I think it's a massive opportunity lost that they didn't do that. Instead, we sort of start halfway through, gloss over everything that happened beforehand, jump straight into a period of time which doesn't exist in the writing, with a set of characters and events that don't exist in the writing. And the whole thing just seems like it's a coincidental series of events, where you've got one of the baddest motherfuckers that's ever lived, who just so happens to be at the right place at the right time, drops a few hints, is the recipient of that, sees that there's a land of Mordor being created, thinks I'm gonna have me a piece of that. It's none of this is orchestrated as it was intended. He is the orchestrator of this. This is all events that happen under his creation. And that is not what is happening in this series. Visually compelling as it is, great hooks and great cliffhangers as they as they as they did. It was just the whole it's fine to be character driven, but just be truthful to the material and show these these I mean Galadriel has far too much of an of a important role in this. She's far too unwise. Elrond is a shadow of his normal self. None of this is consistent with the writings from Tolkien, but they've done it for dramatic effect. Sauron is shown to be pretty shite, to be honest with you. He's showing no power, no intent, no master manipulation. Doesn't show himself in any way, shape or form to be a puppet master or a chess master, which is what he was doing. That's the whole point of this. It's just not very good from canon perspective. But... It's definitely worth a watch if you're a lover of the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. It's great to see Middle-earth in a different setting. Season 2, we hope, is going to bring some more explanation and maybe some more continuity to this. Because one of the other things I haven't even touched on yet is the introduction of the Hardfoots, which is almost like an ancestor to the Hobbits. Um, they don't exist in Tolkien's writing. We see the Astari land in Middle-earth, which is an entire age too soon. Sauron and, uh, so beg your pardon, Saruman and Gandalf were only sent to Middle-earth in the Third Age when it was clear that a necromancer, which would turn out to be Sauron, was up to no good. And the Ainu suspected that Sauron may return. And so these Maya, who would become wizards and guides on Middle-earth, were sent to try and protect and guard against Sauron's 
are, you know, rising. They didn't exist in the Second Age. So the stranger who's in uh, Middle-earth, who we strongly suspect to be Gandalf, entirely misplaced. Shouldn't be there at all. He didn't exist before the War of the Ring when Sauron was defeated by uh, Isildur. It's a bit of a hodgepodge in that regard, and that's what really fucked me off more than anything, is they fucked around with the story. Be true to the story. If you need to change some character bits because you haven't got the rights, that's fine, but at least be true to the story. Don't bring people in because people miss Gandalf if he didn't exist for a thousand years. That's fucking mad. That's the thing which is frustrating more than anything. It's visually unbelievable. The dialogue is great. The pace is fine. It's the fact they fuck around with the original source material, which is what pissed me off. Billy Boy didn't really want to talk about that in his interview. But at least with Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson followed the story. There are some bits he didn't include, but the majority of the story follows the events of the book. The characters, where they go, how the thing flows... It generally follows the books. This doesn't. This is just fucking all over the shop. The writers have just gone it dipped up shit from whatever is available in this in this period and even in other periods to create this thing which is just a bit incoherent. It's just a real shame in that regard. I hope that season two brings it back around because there's enough there for this to be a really compelling piece of television. Um, if you're a true Lord of the Rings fan you will be pissed off that the source material has been messed with. But I would still advise you watch it because it does give you a good hour's worth of entertainment whilst it is on um, each episode. It's a fantasy world. It delivers on that. If you can detach yourself enough from the original source material, it's still a good watch. But for someone like myself who knows it so well, it was, it was painful when you know what it should be and what you're seeing played out in front of you. Um, let me know what you guys think in terms of your own opinion of it. Were you able to enjoy it for what it was or did you have similar issues with me or do you completely disagree? Let me know. Um, can't wait to hear from you. I'll catch up with you all soon.